2022 is over. Oh, you know me. I don't beat around the bush. 2022 was a tough year. I don't know, maybe that makes some of you roll your eyes. We've all had it rough these last few years for various reasons. For me personally though, this was a remarkably terrible year. I won't pretend it was all bad. A lot of cool stuff happened. I played some really good games, got to meet up with some of my best friends, and at this current moment, I'm doing a lot better. Nevertheless, I like to write something at the end of each year so I can talk about some of the stuff I played. This year though, I felt like going even further beyond that. My intention with this video is to tell you about all of it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. For better or worse, a lot happened even beyond just the games I played. I watched a lot of movies, TV shows, and read a lot of manga. And since a lot of people are always clamoring to hear my opinion on stuff outside of video games, I figured this would be a good time to discuss that stuff. I'll even be giving a bit of a behind-the-scenes look at my thought process regarding the videos I put out this year. Hopefully, it's a fun video. Before we jump in, Patreon. I don't advertise this very much because, frankly, I already feel like I have enough support from everyone. But I made some changes to the tiering and figured it might interest some of you. One dollar gets your name in the credits, same as ever. Three dollars will get you more frequent updates regarding videos. You'll get to know what I'm making at any given time. I'll be sharing thumbnails there as they're completed, and I'll even provide a loose video schedule. Five dollars will get you early access to practically everything. I'll share scripts once they're completed, I'll share the edited audio once it's completed, and you'll gain access to the video anywhere from one day to a full week early, depending on the circumstances. Just figured I'd plug it again. Links in the description. A few disclaimers as well. I'll be talking about some potentially sensitive subject matter. I won't be going into too much detail, but there will be discussions about my struggles with anxiety, including anxiety attacks, discussions about nuclear warfare, war in general, the invasion of Ukraine, stuff like that. I just figured I'd give a warning in case any of that stuff makes people uncomfortable. It'll be discussed rather sparingly, but it will be present throughout. Additionally, since I'll be talking about a lot of shows, movies, anime, and manga, the visual presentation of this video will be taking a bit of a backseat. One of the reasons I don't talk about that stuff on the channel much is because I'm deathly afraid of the more strict copyright vice grip present in those industries. To avoid brushing up against YouTube copyright, I'll simply be flashing an image on screen with various random gameplay footage in the background to simplify the process. Most of you probably consume these kinds of videos in podcast form anyway, so this shouldn't be too different from normal. Alright, January. Hot off the presses of Final Fantasy XIV's Endwalker expansion, I was feeling pretty hopeful about the year to come. There's a reason it was my Game of the Year pick. It filled me with hope at a time where I really needed it. I threw that surplus of energy straight into Kingdom Hearts and made the Dream Drop Distance video. Now, I was not entirely sure what I wanted to do with this one. The script had been in various phases of completion for the better part of a year beforehand, and I just kept tinkering with it, never entirely satisfied. I suppose, in hindsight, Dream Drop Distance has always felt to me like a filler entry, just a way to get Kingdom Hearts onto the 3DS and continue teasing fans about the various running threads that were going to wrap up in the prophesied third game. It was hard not to look at the video in the same way, as yet another stepping stone until I got to talk about KH3, which as some of you might remember, was the entire reason I started making Kingdom Hearts videos in the first place. Ultimately, I decided to inject that hesitation into the video itself, and had its structure mirror that of the game, bouncing back and forth between various seemingly arbitrary points. Even had the idea to splice in the opening lines of KH3 to mark the chapters to better reinforce that vibe of impatience. My editor, Zanchil, otherwise known as Amelia, did a really great job implementing those. She edited several videos for the channel, and it was a huge help. While I was working on the video, I watched a few movies. Finally got around to seeing Encanto, which I adored. It's been a while since a Disney movie really connected with me the way Encanto did. Its musings on generational trauma and what it says about the plight of refugees moved me to tears by the end. Luisa's struggle in particular really resonated with me. I constantly feel this pressure to succeed, to never show weakness, to one-up myself every time, and continue evolving. One of the most painful things for me to do is fail. It's terrifying, and that fear has pushed me to some unhealthy places over the years. I think there's something everyone can uniquely take away from Encanto. It's such a relatable movie, one of Disney's best. I hope it shows up in Kingdom Hearts one of these days. I also watched The Eternals, 
I enjoy some of the higher concept ideas they played with, portraying the struggles of immortality, existing as cogs in a far greater celestial machine. This revelation, their sudden lack of agency, was a compelling and natural conflict, and I like how each of the Eternals had a bit of a different approach to these questions. I don't know that any individual character appealed to me as much as someone like Tony Stark or Peter Parker, but as a group, there was a lot of good drama that kept me invested in what was otherwise a fairly bog-standard Marvel plot. I'm certainly interested in seeing them show up in future movies, provided I continue to stick with the MCU, which seems a bit questionable at the moment. I even read a few comics. The 2019 Daredevil run by Chip Zdarsky was excellent. I was essentially introduced to him through the Netflix show where I fell in love with Matt Murdock. The comic is excellent. Matt is deeply flawed in a way I can't help but find fascinating, even when it puts him at odds with the people around him who genuinely care about him. The Kingpin has quickly become one of my favorite villains as well, so it was cool to see him get an equal amount of focus as a bit of a third party during all the chaos. The conflict with Spider-Man felt so natural too. I usually hate forced hero conflicts like this, but you can tell Zdarsky really understands what makes these characters tick. He also shows this off in Spider-Man Life Story, which follows Peter Parker from his younger years through to his elderly years and eventually his death. Some wild stuff happens in this comic. They travel to space, there's some cloning shenanigans, relationship drama, it really goes some places. But again, Zdarsky just gets Peter Parker. He's not afraid to delve into the ugly side of being Spider-Man, and joining him at various stages of his life gives the story an anthology-esque feel. They even pull off an ending with a similar heft to Logan, with a fitting end for both Spider-Man and Dr. Octavius. They're both amazing comics, and it certainly puts Zdarsky on my radar. I did play some games, well, a game, one that wasn't Dream Drop Distance. Pokemon Legends Arceus released, and since I am an eternal slave to the Pokemon franchise, I checked it out. I'll be honest, I wasn't really looking forward to this one. Something about it wasn't resonating with me, and the lack of new Pokemon was a major letdown. I also couldn't conceive of what the core gameplay loop was really going to be other than catching Pokemon. I guess if you want to be really reductive, you can say that's what Pokemon has always been about. But there was always a reason to collect them. You could put them on your team to battle gyms and become the champion, or go to contests, or trade with friends. None of that stuff was really in Legends Arceus, so I had to wonder, how was it all going to play out? But hey, I was wrong. While I don't think I like Legends Arceus as much as most people do, and would even say I prefer the new games we got, I had a lot of fun with it. Being able to throw Pokeballs to catch Pokemon was incredibly addicting, and it helps that this is your goal in basically every respect. You're a group of explorers trying to understand this new region you found yourself in. What kind of Pokemon exist here? What threats might they serve to human life, and how can we coexist with them? The characters are pretty run-of-the-mill, and the plot written around them is pretty bland, but this core conceit, going out and researching new and potentially dangerous Pokemon, was the hook that kept me going. There, a little sneak peek at my thoughts on Legends Arceus. I'm making a full video on it eventually, so that's all you're getting for now. Overall, a pretty solid start to the year. Eh, that wouldn't last very long. On the 24th of February, Russia invaded Ukraine. At the time, this was something that made me quite angry, for pretty understandable reasons. I'm heavily anti-war for a multitude of reasons, so to see an evil dictator throwing his weight around attempting to invade a country on a whim was alarming, to say the least. My heart went out to Ukraine at the time, and it still does. For most of the month, though, it wasn't exactly on my radar. I was busy with the Black 2 and White 2 video. I was originally going to have this one release closer to the black and white video, but I ran into a few problems with the script and had to delay it. I think a lot of the time I underestimate how challenging a script is going to be, which leads to a lot of delays. I'm never happy about them, but I'd regret it even more if I put something out that was rushed. Ultimately though, I was happy with what I ended up making here. A nice part 2 for the Gen 5 peak of Pokemon. February was a pretty dry month, all things considered. I didn't even finish any video games, and honestly can't remember at this point what I was even playing. I did watch a few things, though. First up, the new Reacher TV show. My dad introduced me to it, and I liked it so much that I ended up binging it overnight, as I do with most shows I get hooked by. It was a very solid action show. I wasn't familiar with the character before, but this certainly put him on my radar. Alan Richson is an incredible actor, and it was a joy to watch him beat the shit out of people. 
I really love Jack Reacher as a character because he strikes this lovable balance of being a bit unhinged and brutally violent, while directing that violence at some truly despicable people. There are also some gags in there that I found pretty damn funny, thanks in no small part to the supporting cast being really solid. This one really blindsided me, did not expect to like it as much as I did. I cannot say the same about the Uncharted movie. I feel like it's probably an exaggeration to say this is the worst film I've ever seen, but it's definitely one of the worst video game films I've ever seen. It understands virtually nothing about any of these characters. They're all tragically miscast, especially Nathan and Sully. Tom Holland is never going to quite fit the mold, but he at least tries his heart out. Sully, though, was a horrible character. Sully in the games was a bit of a scoundrel. He got into some bad shit, but he was always likable. He's one of my favorite characters in general, so to see him be this absolute piece of shit in the movie was painful to sit through. They were obviously going for the arc where Nathan endears himself to Sully by the end, but even during the climax, Sully is still doing stuff that makes me hate him. He's like the world-class example of how not to write a character. The action was very serviceable, and the relationship between Nate and Chloe was kinda cute, but overall it was a very shoddy production that didn't really reach the heart of what made the games fun. Which is amazing to me, because as much as I genuinely love the Uncharted games, they're really just a bit of dumb fun. The movie was just dumb. Bit of a sour note to end the month, leading into March, where I kinda lost my grip. Elden Ring came out in March, a game that I had been anxiously awaiting along with the rest of the world. I've been a massive fan of From Software since I played all of their games in 2016, so it was kind of a shock to me that I picked it up for a few hours and still haven't returned to it. I go over this a bit in the video I made, but I was on the precipice of a mental breakdown in March. The invasion of Ukraine was heating up, world leaders were getting involved, and it was difficult not to believe that the world was inching closer and closer to global warfare. If you were unaware, I struggle with anxiety. It sort of comes and goes with varying degrees of severity. But this was probably the worst it had ever been. I was having anxiety attacks multiple times a week, and there were many days where I had to sort of drop everything and rest, trying not to think about the state of the world. See, one of my biggest fears is my own death. One of my related fears is nuclear war. I despise nuclear weaponry. I always have, and this is why. World leaders can saber-rattle with their nukes, threatening to blow up the whole damn world. I remember learning about the Cuban Missile Crisis in my high school US history class and being dumbfounded that we were this close to nuking everything. As you can imagine, having a massive country with a giant nuclear stockpile invade a neighboring country that is dangerously close to NATO countries, who are supplying Ukraine with arms and various forms of support, spiked my anxiety like nothing else. And to be clear, we 100% should be supporting Ukraine. I support that wholeheartedly, and have even donated myself. Nevertheless, the reality of the situation was hard to ignore. It felt like we were closer to nuclear war than we had ever been, regardless of whether or not that was actually true. I've mentioned it in several videos, but I have a fear of death that can sometimes be debilitating. And that's why I spent the better part of March trying to escape endless thought spirals about the inevitable demise of the planet. I coped in some very unhealthy ways, and I'm not exactly proud of it, but I could not turn off my flight response. It was miserable. My intention with the Elden Ring video was to take some of that energy and present a perspective that may have resonated with other people who might have felt the same way. I thought that it would go over pretty well, considering I am a massive fan of FromSoft and their games, but, uh, wow. It did not go over well at all. I would say maybe 50% of those comments were absolutely horrible, and definitely made my mental headspace even worse. There's a possibility that the comments since have been a lot better, but if you think I'm going back into that minefield of a comment section ever again, you'd be wrong. I am thankful to the many comments I got who understood where I was coming from and even resonated with what I was trying to say, but man, the response to this video is one of the worst, and I still haven't entirely gotten over it. People even accused me of rushing out a video to ride trends. I just don't get it. Was it really such a sin to say that I wasn't in the right mental headspace to play what looks to be a phenomenal video game? Are gamers that damaged? Despite March being a horrendous month overall, I did manage to get through some stuff. 
I watched The Batman, which was incredible. This might be sacrilegious, but the more time I've had to sit and think on it, the more I think this is straight up my favorite live-action Batman. I really enjoy the Dark Knight trilogy, but the style of this new Batman really captured me. I love Robert Pattinson's more brutal take on Batman, where Bruce barely even feels like a person. He's so entirely absorbed by Gotham and its darkness, which is portrayed brilliantly. It's almost always pouring rain, accentuating the bright colors and making the whole film feel really moody. It's impressively well shot, with amazing fight choreography that makes each punch hit home. This is probably my favorite interpretation of the Riddler, making him into an imposing threat Batman has to solve more with his brain than with his brawn. The music is awesome. It's just such a well put together movie that has everything I love about Batman. Writing about it now makes me want to go watch it again. I finally got around to finishing Final Fantasy IV. I'm not really sure when I plan on continuing the Final Fantasy videos. I had originally planned to do a combo video on both 4 and 5, but I didn't end up finishing 5 this year, and have so much distance from both of these games that I'd probably have to play them both again to get a proper read on them for a script. Which is a problem because I did not like Final Fantasy IV very much. I found it thoroughly unimpressive. I didn't really like many of the characters, the dungeon design was really frustrating, the plot was dangerously simple and predictable. It wasn't really my cup of tea, as it were. Since I plan to make a video on it eventually, I want to hold the reasons why a little closer to my chest, and I really do hope I can get to it soon. When I said I want to play through all the Final Fantasy games, I meant it. I wish I had infinite time so I could get to all the things I want to do, but alas. Things did not get better in April. I was still afraid that we were all going to die practically every day. Once the thought entered my mind, which was very easy since Ukraine was in every headline, I would spend the entire rest of the day freaking out about it. I was trained to be a journalist, so it was second nature for me to keep up with world events, and having them be so dominated by a topic that gave me anxiety attacks made it difficult to function normally. As you'll see, other than gathering footage for the video I put out that month, I didn't actually play any games, or really do much of anything. It feels almost guilty of me to say, especially when Ukraine itself was suffering far more than me, and yet, the first half of the year was one of the hardest periods of my life. It was a struggle to get myself out of bed every morning, to work up the motivation to work on videos, to do basically anything except have anxiety attacks, and well, I'm sure you can imagine the ways in which I tried to cope initially. I'm not comfortable going into it at the moment, but it was a bad, bad time for me. In a way, it feels like I'm still recovering from how much this set me back. It's a miracle I even managed to release videos around this time. I got the Sonic Advance video out mostly because I wanted to play something I was more familiar and comfortable with. Whatever plans I initially had were all but shattered when my brain flew off a cliff, so I decided to focus on stuff that would be easier for me to handle. The Sonic Advance games were relatively easy topics. I'd played the games from a young age and knew pretty much exactly what I wanted to say about them. Plus, I feel like they had always been unfairly overshadowed by their Genesis counterparts when getting ported to newer systems, even though I feel like the Advance games are still in desperate need of modern ports. I thought it was a pretty great video, all things considered. Also watched the second Sonic movie, which I enjoyed. To be honest, these movies are filled with stuff I don't really like. Annoying pop culture references, jokes that don't entirely land, and a fairly bland human world. It's really saved by the characters being so well realized. I adore this version of Sonic, I think they really understand what makes him appealing. Knuckles is more threatening than he's been in literal decades, and I love how much energy was injected into this character. I actually bought that he was a worthy rival to Sonic, it was incredible. Tails was also really cute, though I wish they focused a little more on him. I feel like they probably could have extended this movie, and yet they also filled it with unnecessary shit anyway. I don't know, it certainly wasn't perfect by any means. It's not even really the kind of Sonic I'm used to. Even the music was pretty bad, which is surprising given the series' pedigree. But it was still an enjoyable time with a version of Sonic I don't hate, and I'm looking forward to seeing if they do Shadow Justice in the third movie. To round out the year, I read Goodbye Eri by Tatsuki Fujimoto. I absolutely love Chainsaw Man, it's one of my favorite manga series, so I was already on its wavelength going into this one-shot. Somehow, that didn't even prepare me for how beautiful this story was going to be. Fujimoto is an insanely good character writer. I think it's because he doesn't shy away from the stranger aspects of human life. 
we're miserable little creatures sometimes, but instead of wallowing in despair about the human condition, his stories embrace that awkwardness. I almost don't even want to spoil what happens, it's a pretty quick read if you're interested. It's made Fujimoto one of my favorite authors. We continue the trend of mental anguish that began in March, sliding headlong into May. It's weird thinking back, this part of the year is a mangled haze of information. Trying to piece all of it together again has actually been a bit of a struggle, and I'm not confident I would have even been able to remember anything that happened if it weren't for the fact that I was keeping a media thread going. That's how lost I felt. But life must go on, and I still had work to do. To commemorate my channel's 7 year anniversary, I decided to finally make another Kirby video. It actually shocked me that I hadn't made another one since my literal first ever video considering how much I love Kirby, so I decided to make my comeback by talking about everything. This turned out to be far bigger than I could take on at once, especially with my mental state being the way it was, so I had to turn the project into a three-parter, one that I'm still actively working on. The next part should release next year, by the way. It's interesting because I feel like this year I had a lot of growth as a creator. I stepped outside of my comfort zone, I played around with video structure, and made some of my most creative stuff. But then, I also defaulted to my standard talk about games format for videos like Pokemon and Kirby. It's hard to know which of these styles is better, or if there even is one I should focus on. I had fun making all the videos that were released this year, so maybe I'm looking into it a little too much. I suppose my Xenoblade Chronicles 2 video is something I'm more proud of than my Kirby video, but I also enjoyed making them both an equal amount. These are questions I have to keep asking myself as I continue to make videos, and it's a struggle I think I'm looking to rectify in the coming year, which I'll talk about at the end of the video. I watched Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and it was pretty good. I thought it was a nice sequel to the original, it was a nice conclusion for Wanda's character, it gave Doctor Strange a lot to think about, delving into the darker paths he could have potentially gone down. I think Sam Raimi did a fantastic job shooting the film, it made the Scarlet Witch feel pretty imposing. It was generally a pretty gross film in a way I found really refreshing. Yeah, it was pretty good, but by this point my interest in the MCU was waning. I tried my best to get through Moon Knight, but I couldn't really do it, and I actually skipped most of the shows that came out during the year. I didn't think I'd ever be saying that, but it sort of just happened. I feel like one of these days I'll feel the drive to jump back in, but for now I think I'm a little burnt out by it all. That brings us to Kirby and the Forgotten Land, which is actually my third favorite game of 2022. I loved this one. It was a fantastic step into 3D. This is my favorite set of copy abilities. I love that you get to upgrade all of them. The levels were super fun with the post-apocalyptic theming. Running through abandoned malls and amusement parks gave it such a unique vibe, even if it was still mostly relying on the more generic fire and grass coatings. Each level was fun to plow through, whether I was speedrunning or looking for hidden Waddle Dees. Kirby has always been great at hiding its secrets, but having it in a 3D space this time made them so much more fun to find. The bosses were fun, the music was good. I have to save something for the eventual video, so I'll stop it here. But man, what an incredible Kirby game. Helps that I played through it all with my girlfriend. I think that part of it, paired with Kirby being really cute in general, helped make this month just a tad less miserable. Things were spiraling out of control at this point in June. My usual coping mechanisms were making things worse, I was developing psychosomatic illnesses, which was pretty bad because illnesses of any kind made me even more anxious. I got checked into the ER at one point due to weird chest pressure and an uncomfortable spasm in my legs. I'm a little embarrassed about it now since it just turned out to be a result of my out of control anxiety and dehydration, but like. I think you probably understand how bad of a headspace I was in. So I finally did something I had never done before. I started therapy. I suppose this was the push I needed to start seeing someone, and you know what? I am kicking myself for not doing this a few years ago. Since first seeing my therapist earlier this year, I have been able to understand myself so much more than I thought I did. It has been a liberating experience, and it has had such a positive impact on my life. 
though my mental wounds ran deep, and it was going to take a lot of time to sort through it all, so June certainly wasn't a cakewalk. This is actually evident by there being no video this month. I came to the conclusion that this once a month schedule was untenable at that moment, and gave myself extra time to finish Xenoblade 2. Given how well that video turned out, I am so happy I gave myself that time. I feel like a lot happened this month. I played some Point B, a delightfully addicting little mobile game by the creators of Downwell. Not much to say about it other than I played it quite a bit. I also got around to Sonic Origins, which was... fine. Not the best collection I've ever seen, not the worst. It was simply... fine. I watched Top Gun Maverick though, which was much more than fine. This was another movie I didn't really know much about. My dad was really excited to see it, but that was sort of the extent of my exposure to it. So I went to see it and thought it kicked ass. I wasn't expecting to like it so much, but it was just such an engaging film. It was well shot, it told a really good story, I grew to love the characters. It got in, did exactly what it needed to do, did so as stylishly as possible, and got out. I've watched so many interviews and behind the scenes videos about Tom Cruise, and though I've learned many, many strange things about him, I've come to the conclusion that he really loves making films. I've never seen an actor so closely involved with the process like he is. Like, the fact that he still does his own stunts is crazy to me, but he just loves doing it so much. That passion is infectious, and you can feel it in his movies. I actually did a lot of traveling this month, which helped keep my mind off a few things. I took a vacation to Italy with my girlfriend. I think eating the food there made me hate all other food everywhere, it was outstanding. We visited Venice, Florence, and Rome. Did a lot of walking, getting some much needed exercise, and marveling at the beauty of these ancient cities. It was a much needed vacation for me, and though it didn't magically fix everything, I felt like I was finally able to relax just a little bit. Soon after, I drove to Philadelphia to meet some of my best friends and attend too many games. It was a fun time. Ate some Philly cheesesteaks, soaked in the city. Our Airbnb had a roof we could sit on. The convention was cool too. Got some cool stuff there, met some cool people. It's unfortunate that we all got hit with several different sicknesses that spread to a new person each day and left me puking my guts out the first half of the week and coughing my lungs out as I was returning home. Kinda soured the trip a bit, but it was still really fun. We watched Obi-Wan Kenobi at some point, but I wasn't too into it. I couldn't tell if it was the sickness or because I just genuinely didn't care about it, but I guess it says a lot that I almost forgot it even happened when I looked back on my media thread. It was a pretty good month, all things considered. Alright, so here in July, now I'm in therapy, things are getting better every day. It's still pretty bad, some days are still uneventful, sometimes I get trapped by my anxiety thought spiral, but I also have days where I get a lot done. I finished the Xenoblade 2 video, which is still my favorite video of the year. I think I said everything I needed to say in the best way I could have said it, and every comment I got honestly meant the world to me. I'm so glad it resonated with people the way it did, and to have that happen with a video I put so much time into made it all the sweeter. It made me think about how I want to continue making videos in the future, and sort of opened up an alternate pathway I hadn't even considered taking before, which was nice. You'll notice I definitely indulged in my more creative side in the coming months, and this video was a big reason why I ended up doing that. I managed to do a lot of other things this month too. I watched Thor Love and Thunder, which I enjoyed well enough. There were a few jokes that didn't land, and I don't think I enjoyed it more than Ragnarok, but I dug the story it was telling. I thought they reincorporated Jane Foster back in a compelling way. Gore was a really fun villain. There were some memorable action sequences spread throughout the film. It didn't light my world on fire or really even get me interested in other MCU projects, but it was a fun watch. I played TMNT Shredder's Revenge with some friends. I don't think I will ever like beat-em-ups. I will just never understand the appeal of them. They're kind of fun with friends, but eventually they all reach this point where you're mindlessly mashing buttons, watching flashy stuff happen. This one relies heavily on you being a fan of TMNT. I am not one, which made it even harder to get into. I think it's impressively well animated with some cool music, but even with a ton of friends, I couldn't get past the boredom. I don't think it's anything personal, I am simply convinced this genre will never be for me. I've come to terms with that. I didn't even really like the Scott Pilgrim game, and I know people will probably get on me for that take, but hey, it's true. Klonoa Fantasy Reverie came out. It's still a bit surreal that I can say that a new Klonoa thing came out this year. It's a decent collection, a bit bare-bones and flawed in its own ways, 
but mostly does a great job remastering two of my favorite games ever made. It's especially nice to finally see a remaster of Klonoa 2, given that it is my favorite game of all time. It's such a pain in the ass to play on PS2, since it has HDMI desyncing issues during its loading screens that I hated dealing with. Since emulation for 2 still has a bunch of problems, it's nice to have a version of it that I can play whenever I want on any platform I want. Klonoa, as you can guess, is very special to me. I plan to make a Klonoa video one of these days. I was going to make it in August before I shifted my plans pretty hard, but it is still in the works, and one day, I hope to share with all of you why it's so special to me. And then we got Xenoblade Chronicles 3. This is my game of the year. I got a ton of requests to make a video on it throughout the year, and I'm sorry I haven't gotten to it yet. I adore this game, and have wanted to talk about it since I finished it. You actually have no idea just how desperately I want to write about it, but since I know there's going to be an expansion story similar to Torna, and because I want to give myself time to digest the main game and do another playthrough, I had to give myself that time. The video will release next year, at some point, but for now I'll leave you with this. Xenoblade 3 has some very poignant themes that almost all resonated with me on a deeply personal level. I love so many of its characters, I love its world, its music, its environmental design, its level design, its combat, its job system. It actually makes me kind of regret titling my Xenoblade 1 video the way I did, because 3 feels like a true masterwork, and it's easily my favorite game in the trilogy. I hate to be a tease, but that's all I'm going to leave you with. You won't have to wait too long, I promise. No video in August, but I suppose that's a sign of recovery. I'm not stressing myself out trying to get a video out every month anymore, and therapy is helping out a lot. Slowly but surely, I'm recovering. Oddly enough, I didn't actually do much this month, and that's because I ran into a bit of a brick wall. Originally, I was going to make the Pokemon X and Y video, and I got quite a bit of work done on it. I did a full playthrough of X, wrote the first part of the script, and then I stopped. I was having a really bad case of writer's block that lasted so long I essentially had to shift gears for a while. Because of that, most of my time playing games was for work, but I did play a bit of the new Mario Kart 8 DLC. The first wave came out back in March, and the third wave in December, so I guess I'll take this time to talk about all three waves. I think it's pretty obvious they're just ripping these straight from Tor. They don't quite mesh with the visual quality of the tracks in the base game, which is unfortunate, and a few of their picks have been questionable. Did anyone really want to see Toad Circuit? Overall though, I think I'm honestly just glad we're getting more Mario Kart of any description. I love the games, and 8 is probably my favorite, so adding even more tracks to it is only a win in my book. It means that 8 now has some of my absolute favorite tracks in it, like Waluigi Pinball, Coconut Mall, and 3DS Rainbow Road. The tour tracks are okay, though they tend to blend together, and a few of them are actually pretty disorienting when they change direction. Some of the new tracks are a little lame. Sky High Sunday is an awful track, just a big circle with far too many trick ramps. It's just really boring, and I do not like the theming very much. Merry Mountain is also just a big, boring circle. How fun. It's just funny looking at stuff like this when we also get bangers like Ninja Hideaway where there's stuff to contend with every 5 seconds, shortcuts to take, upper and lower pathways. It's jarring to have such a disparity in complexity. I suppose it's good to have something more simple every now and then, but some of these really feel like they were built to be played on a phone. It's a bit of a shame, but like I said, it's nice to have an excuse to boot up Mario Kart 8 every now and then, and when all of the tracks are released, Mario Kart 8 is going to have the absolute best track list in the series. Better Call Saul concluded its sixth season run, and what a phenomenal show it was. Every single episode outdid the previous one, and it came to a satisfying finish. Now that it's over, I can't help but look back in awe. How did they make something this good? The series started a little slow for sure, but it was all in service of building this series-long tension that peaked in the final season. Every single episode felt like walking on eggshells, waiting for the train to crash. Every episode had one or two shots I couldn't stop thinking about. The actors lived in these characters. I came to know them better than they knew themselves. It was such an engrossing show from start to finish, and it is a more than worthy successor to Breaking Bad. I miss it already. Sad it's gone. Glad it happened.
I'm doing a lot better by September. I've begun training myself not to look at the news too often, and have begun practicing mindfulness. I haven't had an anxiety attack in a while, and everything is a little more peaceful. Despite that, the stress of YouTube was still weighing on me quite heavily. Doing this job might seem like a dream come true, and in most ways it is. But like any job, there are stressors associated with it. I have to worry about the kind of videos I put out, whether the algorithm will favor them, whether the subject matter will get me demonetized, all the while juggling those concerns against the things I actually want to make. It's sometimes hard to find a balance, especially when I run into writer's block. So I do what I usually do when I'm struggling. I default back to Sonic the Hedgehog. And in an odd twist of fate, I think they turned out to be some of my favorite videos of the year. This month, it was Shadow the Hedgehog, a game I've always had a strange relationship with. I don't quite love it, and I don't quite hate it, but I also wouldn't say I find myself in between. In a way, I both hate and love it, and that has always really confused me. As such, I wanted to give the video that same paradoxical energy to better express how conflicted I am about it. I think it got across very well, and I'm particularly happy about its structure. I spent a lot of time mapping out how the video would go, and was originally going to have many more chapters, but decided on something a little more simple after much consideration. Ultimately, I'm glad I streamlined the idea because I think the end result was far better for it and got across what I was going for a lot better. I played some other games this month too. Pac-Man World Repack is a remake of the first Pac-Man World. I've always admired that original game, I even have an ancient video of it deep in the annals of my channel's history. The remake was not the best, if I'm honest. The level design is unchanged, so it's still fun to run through them and collect all the fruit, but there were a number of problems with the presentation that were incredibly distracting for me. The music, which already felt pretty low quality on the PS1, feels even worse when everything else got such a shiny upgrade. That visual upgrade is nice, but it also led to many depth perception problems that I never ran into with the original release. I would have liked a more detailed shadow to indicate where you were, maybe like the amazing indicator in Crash 4. I also feel like a lot of the game's charm was sucked out of it. This is a little harder for me to pin down, but everything feels a bit plasticky and sanitized. Talkman used to feel a little foreboding, and now he seems like a cartoon villain. Levels like Under Pressure used to put me on edge, and now they strike me as quite tame. I never played this game as a kid, so I don't think it's any sort of nostalgia talking. I just don't think I vibe with many of the changes and would prefer to play the original. I also played I, The Somnium Files, Nirvana Initiative, which happens to be my fourth favorite game of 2022. Kotaro Uchikoshi is one of my favorite directors. His games are an absolute delight. I love the Zero Escape trilogy. Yes, I even love Zero Time Dilemma, as flawed as that one is. I similarly adored I, The Somnium Files when it released, and was really excited for the sequel. This one surpassed the original and then some. It surprised me in ways I never thought Uchikoshi would be capable of doing again. At this point, I thought I'd seen it all but the major plot twist of this game was so impressive that I'm not even going to spoil it here. Please go play it for yourself if you haven't. It made me think about the story in an entirely new way. It's so impressively crafted. I love all the new characters. It still manages to nail a bit of the horror vibes of the Zero Escape games in select moments, and the production values are higher here than they've ever been. We're far from the Zero Time Dilemma jank, and I'm very happy about that. It's a fantastic game, and though it is possible to play standalone, I would recommend trying out the original first. It actually has a really neat feature at the beginning where it asks players to answer a question they'd only know if they finished the original, in order to tailor the experience to new and returning players slightly differently. It's such a cool game, and one of my favorites of the year. October was pretty decent. Looking back at the first half of the year, it feels like a jumbled mess. I'm pretty far away from that headspace, and yet I still feel like I'm in recovery mode. Even though I have a long way to go and so many more things to work out, I'm able to focus on getting my work-life balance in order, spend more time with friends and family, and give myself more time to relax. This month is the Sonic 06 video, which was a very nice counterpart to the Shadow video. Initially, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with its structure, but when I started untangling the game's story, I started to realize that the past, present, and future dynamic was as relevant to my video as it was to the game itself, and fit the three major points I wanted to hit so well that I ended up going with it. I think it worked wonderfully. 
To be honest, I was always afraid of making an 06 video because I felt like there was nothing left to say about it, but I ended up finding that my take was entirely my own, and I think I added a lot of much-needed nuance to the conversation. My goal with these two videos, and with all of my Sonic videos really, was to inject more perspectives into the discourse and encourage people to think a little more about the ideas presented. I wanted to challenge preconceptions about what Sonic should or should not be. In general, I find discussions surrounding what something should or shouldn't be incredibly tiring. At the end of the day, I believe that everything we feel about art is subjective, and as such, the idea of what something should or should not be is also subjective criteria for me. If five different people played Sonic 1, you'd get five different answers as to what people think the core of the game was. At the end of the day, I find it much more reasonable to follow the trajectory of the series and decide whether that trajectory is good or bad on the merit of the releases themselves. Many of my favorite Sonic games are not quite where I would have taken the series, but I'm also happy that they exist all the same. Basically, I wanted to get people thinking, and I think I accomplished that. While working on the video, I played the 16-bit fan remake of Sonic Triple Trouble, and it was awesome. It was so well handled, in fact, that I choose to believe this happened right after 3 and Knuckles. The level design is really good, chock full of secrets and momentum-based jumps. It's a little more linear, especially near the end, but I think considering the source material it's working with, the remake does a great job differentiating each of the zones. You also get to play as Fang and Metal Sonic, who each bring their own unique abilities to the table. It's a very good remake. I also binged Spy Family and loved every second of it. I've watched the entire show as of now and read every chapter once it was completed. It is one of my favorite shonen and I am eagerly awaiting new chapter releases. I would die for every member of this family. Lloyd strikes this balance of being a goofy dad out of his league while also working as a professional spy, Yor is a trained killer but she's also an amazing mother, and Anya is one of the best child characters I've ever seen. She's not too wise, not too dumb, not too smart, and not at all annoying. She's this perfect balance where she messes up a lot and isn't very book smart, but she also isn't stupid and simply lacks life experience to make sense of the world around her. I don't have kids of my own, but spending time with some of my younger cousins, Anya acts exactly like them, and it's refreshing to see. It's mostly an episodic show, with a solid enough overarching goal. It's a premise you can essentially do whatever you want with. It's also a surprisingly funny show, with moments that actually almost had me crying with laughter. And yet, despite how lighthearted it all is, the two neighboring nations are in the midst of a cold war, and the threat of full-blown war threatens to disrupt this peace at the drop of a hat. Many of the adults in this show are traumatized by wars they've fought in, people they've lost, and want nothing more than to maintain this peace that they consider nothing short of a miracle. It's one of the brightest takes on the horrors of war I've ever seen, because it shows us what war threatens to take away. I love it so much, and one can only hope it sticks the landing. Most shonen don't, but I'm hoping it continues to do well so it doesn't meet an untimely end. November took a bit of an unexpected turn. I wasn't originally planning on making a Frontiers video, I was not looking forward to the game at all, and I was happy to just move on and let everyone have their fun. But then my request for a review copy was approved, and I got a ton of comments absolutely incredulous that I wasn't excited for Frontiers. That gave me enough motivation to want to put my thoughts out there and wrap up my feelings on Sonic in a neat little bow. I think it went over pretty well at first, but as time went on, I became increasingly bitter towards the fanbase until I wanted essentially nothing to do with them by the end of it all. Instead of being happy that people are enjoying Frontiers, like I usually would with games I don't particularly care for, I instead watched as people were dogpiled for criticizing the game and not joining in on the hype cycle. It really felt like you couldn't even have a discussion on Frontiers. You either liked the game and got to be a part of the Sonic fan club, or you disliked it and were excommunicated. I recognize that many fanbases are like this, but I suppose the size and ferocity of Sonics took me off guard this time. I've been a Sonic fan my entire life, and the way people behave themselves surrounding Frontiers was nothing short of embarrassing. Harassment, death threats, misgendering, the whole shebang. I mean, we can clown on Cyberpunk and Balan Wonderworld all the live long day, but the moment Sonic gets involved, suddenly he's solving world hunger! It soured me on Sonic discussion quite a bit, 
I don't want to talk publicly about Sonic if what I met with is disdain for not following the agreed upon consensus. I thought Frontiers was painfully mediocre and I will not apologize for that, nor should anyone be expected to. Everyone else can have their fun, but if you're not going to accept my point of view, then please enjoy the game far away from me. I don't want to talk to belligerent children anymore. Near the end of the year, I usually end up playing and watching a lot more stuff. These last few months tend to see me scrambling around trying to catch up on some of the stuff I missed, so don't be surprised if they're longer than the other months. I watched Black Adam, which was pretty mediocre. It felt like this started production as a Justice Society movie starring Black Adam, and then molded itself into a Black Adam movie. I watched this more recently than most of the movies I've seen this year, and I struggle to even remember what happens in it. I think I like The Rock as Black Adam, but he doesn't really have a character to embody. He feels like Man of Steel Superman with magic, who is a little more hardcore, with somehow even less personality. Just wasn't quite feeling it, I guess. One Piece Film Red, on the other hand, was a phenomenal movie. It was so, so good. The music was amazing. I'm still listening to the soundtrack, actually. Uta was a character I was unsure of before watching the film, but grew to really love by its end. I actually found her immensely relatable in a lot of ways, and the end of the film had me in tears. It's very well animated like most One Piece movies, and the climax was really cool. One Piece is special to me for a lot of reasons, and this only added to that gargantuan list. I found myself playing Pokemon Violet. I know, big shocker. It's a buggy mess that crashed on me a few times, and yet I've had more fun with this one than I've had with Pokemon in quite a while. The online multiplayer was really fun. I thought basically all the new Pokemon were excellent. The story was actually really good. The end of the game was probably too ambitious for the time they had available to them. And while it sucks that it had to be compromised in such a distracting way, I was still losing my mind at the cool shit they pulled. Again, I want to save it all for a video, but suffice it to say, I had fun with the new Pokemon game. I had a ton of problems with it, but I still had a smile on my face while going through it. A game I actually enjoyed far more was The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky. I've only gotten through the first chapter, or the first game, but I was instantly hooked on the series. I've bought all the games and am ready to slowly make my way through them. The world building is immaculate enough to push me through the slower beginning and somewhat repetitive combat. Everything you do in Trails expands the world in some way. Basically every side quest will teach you a new thing about the world, or you'll get to know a random character extremely well, and they might even show up later. Every person walking around has a name, a background, and their own motivation. More than just the party you gather, who are all great in their own ways, each town you visit is a hub of interesting characters and self-contained plot lines that make for a really satisfying adventure. This quest to become full-fledged bracers and all the people Joshua and Estelle meet along the way is such a compelling hook for me. I'm a sucker for adventure stories, and this premise is able to fill out the whole country the characters live in, while also getting you thinking about what's happening in the rest of the world. It's hard to explain fully why that is, there's just this magnetic pull the game has since every character you come across is relevant in some way. It makes you want to pay attention to every single line of dialogue and piece the world together yourself. It's an amazing game, a perfect complement to my Steam Deck, and I'll certainly be chipping my way through the second chapter relatively soon. And so we find ourselves at the end. December. I am in such a good place now. I still struggle with anxious thoughts, my mental health isn't 100%, but I'm doing so much better than I was. I can actually control my fight or flight mode and live my life with a relative sense of normalcy. Though I must confess, my recovery was an exhausting process. It still is. Therapy is basically the reason I was able to start recovering, but it isn't an easy fix. Like any medical procedure, in order to heal these wounds, I had to unpack some fairly uncomfortable ideas and feelings, which was stressful in its own way. Necessary, but still a lot of work. Still, I'm glad I started going, because who knows where I'd be right now if I didn't. To round out the year, I finally figured out why I was struggling with X and Y so much. It didn't feel like a natural starting point. I decided to go back and talk a bit about the early days of 3D Pokemon, since it felt like such a good time for it. I'll admit, I didn't quite know how to structure the video, and basically just defaulted to talking about each of the games, but I still think it turned out pretty well. As I'll talk about soon, I think there's a place on my channel for several types of video some more rudimentary, and some a little more experiential. I did the most this month than any other, so 
strap in. I binged all of Andor and thought it was spectacular. I almost feel like I can't say anything better than Just Right did. You should check out his video if you haven't already. Like him, I adored the ways in which this series depicted several facets of fascist control without any compromises. I have absolutely no clue how Disney ever approved this show without forcing them to write a good guy cop or something, but hey, I'm not complaining. It's paced so well. They tackle a new idea in Corner of the Galaxy in three episode chunks, each chipping away at a different part of Andor, molding him from a disinterested drifter into a full-blown revolutionary over the course of a single season that is completely believable. It's just a really, really solid show, and I couldn't recommend it enough, especially if you're burnt out on Star Wars. I hope we get more stories like this. I played God of War Ragnarok, and it was good. I was never a huge fan of the 2018 God of War, but I enjoyed it well enough that I was looking forward to the sequel. It feels like pretty much the same game with a few improvements, but that also means I didn't feel any particularly special connection to it. I think I've always had a problem with the combat in these games. I really hate the camera perspective, and paired with the faster enemies in this game, while I appreciate the upgrades that do exist, they're a bit drowned out by how disorienting it all feels to execute. I thought the story was decently well done, but the climax was extremely rushed and fairly unsatisfying. The first half of the game feels like it's been stretched out beyond belief, and then at some point a switch is flipped and we're moving at a mile a minute. The characters definitely save it for me. I'm very attached to Kratos, Mimir, and Atreus' journeys, and felt satisfied with where all of them ended up. Again, I did enjoy my time with the game, and there were a few scenes that almost got me to well up a little, but the problem still remains that they aren't quite my cup of tea. It probably won't stay with me much longer, much like the original slowly drifted from my memory. I played all three Spark the Electric Jester games, and had an interesting time. To be honest, I don't have much to say about Spark 1 and 2. The original is an interesting mix between Sonic and Kirby, without really reaching the heights of either. It also has a painfully bad story. Spark 2 feels like a prototype. It's an incredibly short Sonic Adventure type game with another quite bad story. Admittedly, the levels in it were decent, but they all pretty much felt exactly the same, making the whole thing blend into an unsatisfying mash. Spark 3, though, was pretty damn cool, and I'd probably even say that it was my fifth favorite game of 2022. The story is still pretty bad, though I do admire how much it really, really tries its heart out. It doesn't work, but damn it, I probably would have made something like this when I was a kid. It's almost charming how indulgent it is. Almost. But the real reason I fell in love with it was the level design. It's built like Spark 2, but the levels aren't just big hallways with a few roads to run down. Here there's more stuff you can do with momentum jumps. There's less focus on power-ups, there's grind rails with momentum you have to exploit for higher speed, wall running and jumping is a mechanic utilized much more often, and the music is pretty good as well. There's also more variance in the theming, with one neat level in particular focusing on illusions that I really enjoyed. Even the boss fights, as simple as they might be, have a nice rhythm to them, since this game has a more punishing parry than Sonic Frontiers somehow. It was a very satisfying ride from start to finish. Admittedly, it was a bit strange ranking this one as my number 5, but I suppose it puts into perspective how much of what I played this year didn't actually come out this year. If I had finished Elden Ring, there's no doubt I wouldn't have even considered Spark 3, but alas, here we are. It gets here for having levels that give me the same high that a lot of my favorite Sonic levels do, and that in itself is a remarkable achievement. Crisis Core Reunion was a nice trip down memory lane. It felt like a nice thing to play at the end of a year this tumultuous, itself being a fairly wild ride of quality. It's a ridiculously detailed remaster of a PSP game, so you watch these characters who look like they came out of the FF7 remake animated like they're still on the PSP, doing missions where you walk down a few hallways fighting a few enemies. The new voice acting is very hit or miss, but as beloved as the original was, it was never perfect there either. I still prefer the original voice cast, especially for Zack, but going back to the game and comparing it to the original, I was surprised just how cheesy the game always was. I suppose it's a testament to the power of the character of Zack Fair and the ending overall that this game still has a place in my heart, given that I still don't entirely understand Angeal or Genesis all that deeply. It's a fantastic remaster, and shines a light on this PSP classic that exposes all of its highs and lows for everyone to see. I thought this would be a neat bookend to the year, but then I figured I'd try one last game mostly to get the media thread up to a clean number 40. So I picked up Tunic and devoured it. This is my second favorite game of 2022. It was so, so close to being my favorite of the year. I almost don't even know how to talk about it. 
It's a Zelda game with Souls-like elements, but that doesn't even begin to really describe the game's appeal. It has a detailed instruction manual that you collect throughout the game, but it goes beyond merely telling you how to play the game. Some of them have maps, most of it is written in an unfamiliar runic language, and in many cases, these pages are required for progression. Again, I can't explain this without spoiling the whole thing for you, so let me give you the cell, and hopefully you'll take me on faith. If you love the discovery of Zelda, you will love Tunic. It takes that concept and runs with it in ways I've never seen a game do before. It redefined how I think about adventure games, and I think I'll probably end up making a video about it eventually. It was an absolute delight and feels like it was catered specifically to all of my interests. Alright, that was my year. A lot of ups and downs, in many ways one of the worst years I have ever had, but I suppose it was a necessary fall. I'm doing great now, and I don't think I would have taken the healthier road if I wasn't in such a horrifically dark place. We have our ups and downs, but I hope to make 2023 a much better year overall. Though if I've learned anything in therapy, it's that I don't necessarily have full control over that, and I need to be okay with that too. I'm going to be taking January off. I mean, to call it a break is a little disingenuous. I'll be working on the video for February during January. I'm just basically giving myself a bit more free time during my work weeks. However, I would still like to aim to get a video out every month. I will abandon that goal if I can't handle it in the end, but at the very least, I should be uploading pretty frequently. I have some cool videos planned, some of which you'll be able to see if you pledge to my $3 Patreon tier. It's gonna be a pretty big year, I think. Finally, I wanted to end the video going over some of the games I'm looking forward to in 2023. No particular reason, it just seems like a nice end to the video. Sea of Stars, developed by Sabotage Studios, is looking really good. It's inspired heavily by Chrono Trigger, they even netted Yasunori Mitsuda as their main composer. I loved their previous game, The Messenger, and it frequently battles with Celeste for being my favorite game of 2018. I also deeply adore Chrono Trigger, so this seems like a match made in heaven. I have the utmost faith in what this team can do, and am extremely excited to get my hands on it. Final Fantasy XVI looks rad as hell. Again, this is also a bit of a pedigree thing. Yoshi P is producing it, and Soken is composing for it, so I'm excited for it on that front. But each of the trailers have made the game look better and better. I think the DMC combat director is on the project, or something to that effect. Whoever's working on it, the combat looks super fun, and the spectacle is really exciting. It must be fun for some of that team to be working on a game that can pull off much more than 14 can. I think it's gonna be a banger. I am cautiously optimistic about One Piece Odyssey. I let myself fall into this trap before with One Piece World Seeker, one of the most painfully mediocre games I have ever played, but Odyssey looks like it could be one of the first One Piece games I really connect with. I think some of the people who work on Dragon Quest are doing this one, and I loved Dragon Quest XI, so if it's anything like that, I think this will be a good time. It's relying a little too much on nostalgia and past locations for my liking, so I can only hope that it has a more original story to tell that makes it feel like its own thing, rather than an amalgamation of nostalgic moments. I'm not expecting the world from it, but I really do hope it impresses me. We don't know much about Pikmin 4, but I am really looking forward to it. I really love Pikmin 1 and 3, and I personally hope it pulls some of the best elements from all three Pikmin games, while still barreling forward in its own new direction. I'm pretty confident I'll end up liking whatever they do with it, since Pikmin has a very unique appeal, so I'm basically just waiting for it to come out at this point. Resident Evil 4 Remake looks like it'll be really good as well. While I was disappointed by the Resident Evil 3 Remake, I still think it was a pretty decent game, and I loved the Resident Evil 2 Remake. With Resident Evil 4 being more primed for action than Resident Evil 3 ever was, I'm hoping it's able to key in on some of those aspects of its design, while injecting just a bit more horror into the proceedings to make it something really fun. I actually haven't played the original Resi 4, so this is a great excuse to finally dig out the original and play it before the remake releases. Really looking forward to it. And finally, to absolutely no one's surprise, I am very excited for Tears of the Kingdom. I don't need to explain why. We've barely even seen the game, and we're all excited for it. Every new Zelda release is exciting for me, and I am chomping at the bit to finally play it. Well, that's about it for me. I hope you enjoyed my output in 2022, and I hope this video was enjoyable. I'm thinking about doing this every year. It's a good way to get my thoughts out there and talk about a lot of things I'm doing that I don't usually get the opportunity to talk about. I'm looking forward to 2023, and though I don't say this too often anymore, I will never truly let it die. I hope all of you have some well-deserved fun today.